on stuff. Who did that? That's my guy back there. That's the kind of energy I need tonight, right? So you guys have one job to do tonight, right? And it's to be lit. You guys do that? Yes? I'm not playing. I came all the way from Cairo. I've been traveling for years, right? I was sleeping at Yassam's house, and he woke me up. I didn't know where I was. It was like Star Wars. I was like, where am I? Right? It's crazy, because I was in Senegal, from Senegal to Cairo, Cairo to JFK, JFK to Philly, Philly to Vancouver, Vancouver to Seattle. Yes, yeah, so I love you guys, like, for real, right? <laughs> love is a verb. It's not just talking about it, right? So um, I'm here. So you guys have one job, which is to be lit. Can you guys be lit? Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see. So if you hear something that you like tonight, what you're going to do, right? I'm going to drop a line, right? And I get you guys to... Make pretend that this line is the dopest thing you ever heard, right? <laughs> so ready. <clears throat> Roses are red, violets are blue. Yeah. That's not it. That's not it. That's not it, right? I need you to act like your favorite gr sweet grandma that makes you pies, right? And soup and wipes your nose when you're snotty, right? That loves you so much. If she was up here doing a poem, how would you treat her? Oh, you guys don't like your grandma's, huh? That's a shame. Okay. If your favorite person was out here, whoever your favorite person is, right, and he said, roses are red, violets are blue. <laughs> you guys don't like people, right? I think I'm with Boone. I think it's the weather. I don't know what it is in Seattle, man. I'm going back to Toronto, man. So, yeah, you guys have one job to do, all right? Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Yusuf. That's yeah to the wild scene. Fa, mujahid like Yasmin. Yeah, a young shab with mad dean. And I can give you buckaroo straight to Yasin. Blessed. And if they ask about self, tell them my bow tie fresh, but in my N O I N O. My second resurrection brethren waiting on a memo. I'm out composed hodge at my back upon the tempo for the sake of what is karma hand whispers from the geno. Tenfo, God gave me the strength to walk upon the light, but devil want me doing endo. Told that sucker N-O. Gave that sucker sucker punch of power of a Kimbo, but slip. Oh shoot, counter punch upon my chin go. Down son of Adam is forever super sinfo. Got an envelope in the mail red, scholarship the tempo. Seen the winking eye, wow, Illuminati symbols. 100K in student loan sticker for your window. College educated, but can't even pay your rent though. You know what I mean? Student loans. It's like the means don't justify the end. So after Charlie Mack, I'll be the second out the limo. Like, yo, take this demo. Listen to this intro. Poet under 30, getting 30s cause my pen dope. Not that I'm on fire. Everybody watch me kendo. Brothers give me dap and the sisters give me dimples. It's funny. <laughs> They wasn't with me shooting in the gym, so I'm all about my Urkel and Lil Winslow, get it? Family matters, I do it for my kinfolk, for them I get the paper like a customer at Kinko's, and oh, they like my lingo, to pour from say my dingo, to get them out of here, the language of the gringos, must be the reason I'm seizing everywhere the wind blow, must be the reason they're grieving everywhere, and so like, oh, you fresh to death, yeah, I thought you knew that, no? Must be a new jack, I'm the cool cat with the cool cap, and the Kohans and the suit rack when I step in, like, who's that? He is real, like where the Jews at, where Philistine is. I'm where the news at, Chuck a dude sat, any dude that think being cool is having two chains and two gats so I can move back. I'm where the youth at. Now put that wherever you keep your truth at. <laughs> I'm going to check one more time, right? That's like my flex piece, right? <laughs> it's okay to flex. You got who, who knows that's okay, okay to flex? See, no, you guys don't. <laughs> I have a problem with that, right? I really have a problem, right? The inside. I don't even have inside pants pockets. Wow, pants pockets. Who said that? <laughs> the devil was a lie. That's crazy, right? Just be like, huh? Okay, yeah. So the problem I have with you guys, right? Not you, but your cousin and them, is that. We can see the beauty in everything. We see the beauty in the mountains and the oceans and the seas and the in lost creations and the skies and say, MashaAllah, that's so beautiful. But then you look at yourself and say, there's something wrong with me. Right? It's so easy to see the beauty in everything else but, but yourself. 
And that's not religiosity, right? It's not religious to look like a bum, right? It's to, you know, some brothers like looking real mustard stain on their throat, on their jelly beer, right? Kufi is all ashy. And it's like, this is the sunnah. Don't feel attacked. I'm not talking about you, not y'all, your cousin and them, right? You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. That one brother with the same <laughs> curry stain on his stove, like for like three, brother, wash that though, please. Stop. That prophet was clean, all right? Um, so it's okay to flex. It's okay to look at the mirror and say, mashallah, is that me? Oh. It's okay to dress nice, all right? Uh, one of the things I started learning when I started learning in Asar was I started to learn about Imam Malik. And he was so fresh and clean. He said when they saw Imam Malik, people would think that there was a king coming in a, in a building. He wore like the finest garments and the, the most expensive oud. And people would come from all over and they would write books talking to Imam Malik like, how can you dress like this and be a scholar? So one person came to Imam Malik and he felt his garment. He said, you can't worship Allah in these clothes. And Imam Malik, this is a garment. He touched it. He said, you can't worship Allah in those clothes. <laughs> he said, I look like Allah provides for me and you look like you need some sadaqah. In my mind, the clap back was cold, right? I said, dang, right? So I'm always waiting for somebody to touch my garments, like, you can't be a teacher in these garments. Got you, right? All right, so, so the idea is to love yourself. Can everybody say, I love myself? I love myself. I feel good about myself. I feel great about myself. I love myself. I, I need everybody to say this, right? I feel good about myself. I feel great about myself. Now hug yourself. Give yourself some love. It's okay. It's okay to hug yourself. Gosh, Seattle. There you go. Hug somebody. That's how it starts, right? You can't love somebody else until you love yourself, right? I heard someone say today, uh, read somewhere that says, do unto others as you would like people to do unto you, right? But everybody doesn't love themselves. So if you don't love yourself and you treat yourself poorly, I don't want you to do me like that, right? <laughs> so treat me like you want, like I want me to treat me, right? Yeah. Whatever, I just I don't understand. Okay. So my family is from West Africa. Uh, any West Africans in the building? Stop, West Africa, we do not act like that, right? I need you to <laughs> stop. Boom, they got that. We have our own thing too. Don't, don't, don't act like that. Don't come to Seattle and act brand new. Wakanda forever. All right? Uh, my father's from Guinea and my mother's from Liberia. But uh, I was raised in Philadelphia. For a funny story, right? I have really, really African parents. Like, OD, extra hyper, like, you know, African all day, like Wakanda forever before Wakanda, right? <laughs> And growing up, I was like, I used to wonder, like, why are my parents so extra? Like, this so extra, right? It would be a Monday morning, and my father would bring me to school, and you have the big dada, you know, those big African garments, right, with the tall kufi that lean to the side, right? And it's December, but he has no socks on and ashy ankles, right? That's, that was my dad, right? And my mom would have the big garment with the big hat wrap with the bright purple and yellow flex on with the high heels, right? It's Monday. Like, where y'all going? <laughs> <laughs> like, you going to work like this? <laughs> You're an electrical engineer. Like, I need you to put some dickies on, like some cargo pants. Stop playing, Dad. All right? But I would be the laughing stock of my school. Like, the kids would just have a ball. Ah, you know? And they would say the wildest things. Do you guys hear African booty scratcher? You guys ever heard that? Who made that up? They were shaitan. They did. Whoever made that up? Little shaitanish, devilish little kids, right? So they would say things like African booty scratch, and I was confused because what does that even mean, right? My booty itches and I scratches it. Does that, doesn't everyone do that? What's the connection? Whatever, right? Anyway, what this did for me, it caused me to have a sort of uh, self-consciousness. I didn't want people to know I was African, and I didn't want people to know I was Muslim. I didn't want to stick out because kids, they're so, like, mean only thing that you have that sticks out, people will make fun of that, right? So I tried my best to blend in. I didn't speak the languages that uh, I learned. I speak five languages, and I didn't want people to know. Until one day when I was uh, trying out for HBO Brave New Voices, and my coach said to me, you have to write a poem about the languages that you speak. And if you don't, you're not going to perform. So he literally, my coach locked me in the room for hours and forced me to write this poem. 
And when I read it for the first time and my father heard it, he laughed hysterically. And when my mother heard it, she cried hysterically. And my father said that if you know the richness of your history, of our tradition, that you are embarrassed of that, is this beyond me? And my mother said that I wish you could have been raised in our homeland to see the beauty of your homeland. And sure enough, um, Mustafa Briggs and myself, we did a 17 university tour touring black history and Islam. And we went to Harvard University. And one of the professors there was like, I know that last name of yours. He said, we study your family in a curriculum. Crazy. He said, go and get this book. It was called um, An Epic of Old Mali. And this book, sure enough, they had my name written in the book and my history of my family about royalty and things. And I couldn't wait to take this to my dad and see, like, look at this thing that I was embarrassed of. It has such richness in it. So up until today's day, I continue to study Timbuktu and Mali, some Jatta Keita, and learn about my ancestors and where I come from. And many of us have similar stories, I believe. The poem. Language has been a lingering smell swaying in the throat of my family since we migrated. My breath is beautified by Africa, homeland, motherland, the aroma of Arabic drowned in seasoned crown on a bed of baked broken bits of Liberian English over marinated my dingo, tenderizing my tongue like vinegar, dialect dripping into my diaphragm, tattooing my chin of traditions. I never knew saliva could taste this good. I live in a household with five functioning languages, able to address my family in several distinctive tongues. Ahna wa sahlan, dao, taramate, has my people doing oh, we doing all right. Decades of indigenous beliefs, rituals, and customs wedged between between my teeth like cassava. I was born like a walking translator. My pyramid-shaped brain trained to decipher expressions like hieroglyphics. This English will be the death of me. This English is toxic as vodka, contaminated my taste buds. Marhaba Kaifa Enta slowly became hello. How are you? My mother, a delicate touch of brunette, sun-kissed and embellished and bronze, told me, Papi, remember who you are and where you come from. So my first day of third grade, I greeted my class in my father's dialect. Taramasi, Kodi Yusuf Kroma. The classroom exploded in the laughter. The other kids began began clicking and knocking, mimicking sounds that did not belong to my tribe. Hey, you, how come you Africans smell so bad? Grimacing at the aroma of fried plantain and fufu on my garments, I began to abhor my lineages. Country of contradiction only wants to steal diversity, cut cultural beliefs into assimilation, generations dismembered like, like ancestral dialects, lost in translation. It's taken me 17 years to appreciate my languages, to admire the articulation and the rhythms of my tongue, tucked under, meshed over, and rolled into collage of linguistics. My language is create a portrait of me, an African harvested plum tree, ivory coast coated smile, black diamond mine eyes are for strut as if the world was my father's farm asking, who am I without my culture? Who am I without my heritage? Who am I without my language? Who am I without my dean? Hollow, without purpose, without meaning, my breath will fumble the sounds of my ancestors. So I remind all of you, remember who we are and where we come from. But yeah, so mashallah. So I grew up in Southwest Philly, as I said, and it's very similar to Seattle in many ways in terms of like things that happen and like with violence and stuff like that. For many years, Philly was the murder capital. And Islam was telling me how dangerous it is in Seattle. I'm like, bruh, like I left Philly because I don't want to deal with this, right? Like, yeah, you know, some got shot over here and such and such. And I'm like, this is crazy. But so much of what I have been through has shaped the person I am today. And it wasn't until I left Philadelphia and I moved overseas to Egypt that I realized how much of my environment, how, how badly has it has affected me. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, growing up, my house was always like the neighborhood house. Like all the kids would always gather in the house and they would come to my house and my mother would cook for everybody. So people would always hang out in my home. And one of my friends said to me one time, Yusuf, why don't you ever come and visit us? We always come and visit you. Why don't you ever come and visit our homes? I said, okay, I'll come and visit you. Like if there's a dawah, if there's an invitation, bismillah, let's go. So there's one friend I went to his house and it was the worst idea I ever had, right? I got to the door and there was no doorknob. All right? He like put the window down and stuck his hand inside and opened the door and like kind of had to kick it in. I was like, oh, this is bad, right? You know a house by his door, right? That's what they say. So we get in the house and as soon as he opens the door, like a, a funk hits me. I'm talking about like Jimi Hendrix funky, like Prince funky. Like it was 
funky, all right? And there were there was like two dogs in the house. The dogs had like defecated on the floor. Like true story, it was bad, right? And there was like a kid running around with no pampers on, like, you know, just it was like raisin bran on the floor. I thought it was raisin bran until it got up and walked away, right? <laughs> I'm talking about roaches, right? And um but that wasn't the thing that perplexed me the most. What perplexed me was that everybody was just in there just chilling, eating chips, you know, watching TV. And I was like, nobody sees what's going on here. You're just going to act like this isn't happening, right? But what I realized is that if, if I were to stay in that environment for a week, for two weeks, for three weeks, for a month, y'all would come and meet me. I'd be in there funky, like just chilling with the roaches. And, and we would all be one happy family, right? So this is what your environment does to you, conditions you and you become complacent until you get exposed to other things. So I didn't realize how violence affected me until I moved to Egypt. And if you've ever been to Egypt, the Egyptians, they have a, almost like an aggressiveness in their culture. Like, they'll talk to you, yeah, I meant to be, right, right? So the first time I got there and the guy talked to me like that, psh, popped him, like, what's, what's going on, <laughs> you know? And he was like, you hit me, I'm Muslim. I was like, yeah, because you were barking on me. Like, what? He's like, no, we just argue, but we're not going to fight. We're Muslim. I was like... Oh, and I've been there for four years, and to this day, I have to, like, train myself, like, not to fight immediately when somebody argues with me, right? But that was the con condition, the culture I was growing. So, like, for the first year, I got into a fight at least once a month. This, you know, because of the aggressiveness, I thought that it would mean, like, fight or flight, like I had to fight. But really, it was just the way they communicated. And they had to, I had to really recondition myself to understand that you don't always have to fight for your life. And I was explaining to people, like, you don't have to talk to me like that, because when you talk to me like that, I think that it's going to go down, right? I saw two uncles in the mash there one time in Egypt, and they were arguing from, like, two sides of the mash, like, heated, like, screaming from the door all the way over there. And I'm like, and I'm waiting for them to meet. I'm like, oh, this is going to be good, like UFC, right? And they get together, and he just kisses them on his cheek. I'm like, where am I, right? But, yeah, so your environment has an effect on you. Uh, so pay attention to that. Even certain places, you'll see even the pigeons and the dogs are mad, right? So imagine the effect that your environment has on you. Anyway, I am one with the one, too woke to close my third eye. The four chambers of my heart is a residence of God, built on the five pillars of Islam. The 666 wants to push me out the six conditions of Iman, till I'm falling from the seven heavens like my grandfather Adam fathomed me, sinking like an eight ball for living like I had nine lives. Now ten toes down to earth, amazed. When I turned 11, I was already 12 years a slave, amazed by the 13th Amendment. But what they did to our ancestors pals in comparison to what they have planned for our descendants at 14, Ibrahim was already facing 15 to life. There was no sweet 16s and 16s. He was sent back and forth through a kite. 17 rakats in a day praying just to make it to 18 because it feels like Palestine on these blocks. They killed my best friend Nasir at 19, only 20 minutes away from his home. That's 21 shots dispersing his arms, legs back in his dome. That's 22 teddy bears decorated a pole that's 23 black boys dressed in all black ready to seek revenge for his soul that's 24 hours of paranoia the streets are watching no talking to cops or lawyers OG's chanting keep it a Goya the slurred vernacular of the city hmm for the prophet I got my first gun from Mujahid I was barely in my teens with a 25 caliber pistol tucked into the waistband of my dickies Black boys born beneath the sunlight scorn, skin torn, tattered, and tatted up. Tattoos like war paint plastered up from ankle to Adam's apple. What? They say black boy is always in battle. What? Black boy is always on the brink of death because death is the only finish line in this race of black boys. What? They say black boy leads in every race besides human. Black boy always be assuming, never comprehending what black boy ain't you always winning. They say you're massaging all these women into misogyny. Don't you refer to all your partners and murder victims as bodies? What? Black boy must be depressed because the only few black boys left are sick and dying. Black boy is sick and tired of being sick and tired. But the black boy remedy is a pill. Two cactus to swallow, swell up in your windpipe. Black boy blows weed wind like to ease the burden. Black boy get high to escape. Black boy takes shots to get wasted or takes shots to get wasted to get makeshift to the day shifts and the waist lifts and gunshots leave all them black boys wasted. Spilled crimson on the concrete basin of black blood. Black bloods and crypts banging beneath the gun blue sky by God. Black boy ain't no stranger to the cemetery. By God, black boy ain't no foreigner to morgue. Rest assured, black boy can't be deaf. Can't abolish slavery in this new context. Black boy too complex. Cause black girl be.
but thinks his mother is a queen. Some black boy never had no father figures, and they figure they are queens, and scientists say there's a defect in our genes hanging off our butt as if it isn't already hard enough to walk. Says nigger every other word as if it isn't already hard enough to talk for black boys. They say black boys are vulgar, black boys are ignorant, black boys are belligerent, black boy be everything besides innocent in the court of law. Where everybody gets freedom, they get him black boy's life, and he's just looking for a savior because he ain't got no savior's own complexion. They say we are destined for doom, that we don't believe in God, only worship at Odum. Too black to raise a sun, but dark enough to hold the moon. Too black to fill an app, but dark enough to fill a tomb. I say, hold oh, black boy. I say, don't you know you are beautiful? Don't you know you are chiseled from the sturdiest of mountains? Black boy, you are a fountain to wash away your wolves. But black boy knows not of his own power and his realness. The revolution's ass resilience. I say, black boy, don't you know you are brilliant? A Frederick D, a Malcolm Max, and Booker T. I'ma do, I'ma do Bamba, Freddie, W-E-B, the boys, black boy, you are everything they're afraid of. So they enslave us to our own complex, but you are too complex to understand. But you are the origin of man. And in the absence of light, you're the universe's plan, black boy. All right, I'm going to do one more poem, okay? Is that okay? All right. Firstly, I want to dedicate this entire performance, all of this beauty, to my sweet Omi over here, mashallah, one of the most beautiful people that you could ever meet. And the Prophet Sallallahu said that if you love someone, you should tell them. So I'm telling you that I love you, Omi. And I pray that Allah connect our hearts in this life and the next. So this is all this for her. You can thank her for all that's happening right now. You guys want to hear a love poem? I need you to act like you want to hear a love poem, right? How many of you guys have ever been in love? Who knows what love is like, right? Stop playing, right? You guys, how'd you all get here? Like, I didn't know what love is, right? How many people have been in love? Right? Why are people so shy about love? Like, <laughs> love don't look like, if your love look like this, that's not love, right? That's dysfunction, right? How many people have been in love, right? So none of y'all, right, this whole front row, like, <laughs> y'all never knew what love, okay, all right. What about y'all over here? How many people have been in love over here? Yeah, you can, love is, yeah, is love, you can love a lot, love yourself, love something, some love your... Oh, oh, I'm not talking about Fatima, man. I'm talking about, or Ahmed, right? You don't got to love Ahmed. You do have to love Ahmed, but not that Ahmed, right? Um, so this is a, I'm going to stick to the poetry. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to embarrass Ahmed, right? He said I'm a good brother. Um, I wrote this poem while I was in Whole Foods, right? A few years ago. <laughs> Whole Foods is inspiration, man, right? Um, I'm a t I'm a, I'm a, can, I, can I be honest and real with you guys? Ahmed said something today. He said, the closer you get to Allah, the realer you get. Right? Because Allah is the real. I was like, dang. Right? So I'm going to be real with you. I was in Whole Foods, and I saw this beautiful sister walking in Whole Foods, right? <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I'm going to keep it 100, right? She was in the aisle 13, right? And it was something about the way she was picking up her almonds. I was like, yo, like, <laughs> I got to find her Wale. Like, this is serious. <laughs> I don't know what it was. Can I be honest, right? Don't act like it's only me. I'm not like, what's that TV show, The Devil's Show, but the guy, um, I'm going to fix you, right? <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about? You. Yo, that's the worst show ever. Like, I had nightmares, like. It wasn't like that, nothing like that, right? It was all halal, right? But I was like, bismillah, mashallah, like, whole I'm like eating healthy in her car. She had whole healthy food. I was like, this is, this is going on, right? So in my mind, as a poet, she said, yeah, I did that last week, right? I'm not see, I see you, right? Um, I started to write this poem, right? And I was like, how fly would it be if I just walked up and just spit this poem in Whole Foods, right? But I was thinking, like, it could go really bad or really good. Like, what is she, like, creep? Call, you know, call security. Now I'm on Instagram. You're like, oh, use it as a creep. It's, it doesn't look good, right? So I talked myself out of saying the poem, right? And <laughs> maybe it was a good thing, right? But I always thought to myself, no matter where I went, what would have happened if I would have said this poem, right? This is the poem. <clears throat> Sister, you've been on my mind like an unfinished poem. And up until this present moment, I have not yet found the words to complete you, to find you, seek you, sweep you off your axes with X's and O's. And all of your X's would know they no longer fit into this equation, and we both will know why. 
When you were head over heels, then we both in those sky like the back of our gracing wings, and I tell you these things will feel amazing. And I would love to love you now, but right now I'm patient because in the back of my mind, I know Allah created the heavens and the earth in seven days to show that great matters take time, and um, I just want to take my time with you. To relish in your presence, a present, your essence goes far beyond the jurisdiction of words. I mean, I mean, you make a brother want to buy a thesaurus and increase his vernacular. I mean, a lesser man would call you spectacular, but I prefer pool cotidianus. Yeah, you look that up, brother, right? <laughs> That's the line right there. <laughs> I prefer pool cotidianus, queen. You must be indigenous to ancient Egypt because I have never seen this contour of women before, at least not in the last millennium. Your melanin, a blast of cinnamon, an amalgamation of onyx, obsidian, and cocoa, and you know, brothers in love with the cocoa, and... Oh, so inspired, I see you cut from the cloth of a sire, and I would love to be your king. But great things don't happen overnight. This love is a journey. So pack your shoes, that beautiful smile of yours, and let's take flight. And, and, and if you want to hear the rest of the poem, you could buy the book. <laughs> That's it. You can get the book. You see that? Marketing 101, huh? I learned a little something in the Egyptian market. Supply and demand. <laughs> so alhamdulillah, uh, that's it, right? Um, could we close out on a fun note? Can I do something? I don't know. We have some time. We good? All right. So I want you. I want to do something called a post check. All right. So I'm gonna engage you guys in the audience, right? Who has some a good voice, like a good singing voice, right? Or a good. Yeah. She said, "No, not me." Not me. In the shower, everybody sound like Beyonce, right? <laughs> um, so just imagine that you're. Anyway, yeah, right? Isam, come on, Isam, because they're going to play, man. Isam, where Isam go? Why you standing? Why you like security, bro? Relax. <laughs> Dang, Isam. Now you just sitting there. He's security. You good. Come here, Isam, please. Come on, man. Isam on post like he on the block. Like, I know you're good. Okay. So can you guys go? If I point to you, I need you to make a sound. No, you guys not cooperating, huh? No. See, this is why I need my squad. Who's down? Who, who can help me out? Who's down for me? You got me? All right, cool. Huh? Pass on. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Who else got me? I need somebody to make a sound. You got? Come on, bro. Come on, come on. Come on. You got the track suit. You got to stay ready, bro. You can't wear a track suit if you're not going to put in no work. So I need you to get up here and act like, come on. Nah, bro, I need you to run up here in that tracksuit <laughs> and help me out. No, there's no bars. This is a sound. You can make a sound, right? Come on, come on. Get, clap it up, from Clap it up. <laughs> clap it up. Uh, you need your squad. I'm your squad. All right, cool. Ahmed, come on. All right, so I need you guys to pick a sound and make it consistently. Whatever it is you feel, whatever sound comes, speaks from your soul, you can just pick one of them. Uh, start. You start. No, you start. Alright. Yeah, yeah. You want me to like, pick a beat or what? No, just, and it, it could be a beat, whatever sound that you make. Boom, tap. Boom, tap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You sound? Pick a sound. Damn. You don't need the microphone, bro. I don't need the mic? No, you don't need the oh, microphone. I thought it was... Okay. No, 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 no. I know you like... No, just relax, bro. You can give the sister back the mic, bro. You don't got it. All right. All right. Can I have, can you help us out with this, please? This minute, come on. See that? You can always depend on the sisters, man. Always depend. That came from her soul. Mm, she was ready, like, what? Wakanda, right? All right, got you, sis. All right, so let's go. We'll start with you. Can somebody snap up here? No, now y'all all want to snap. No, not you. No. Her right here. She got me. No, you good. We good, though. We No problem. There's no beef. We good. All right, go ahead, sis. All right, go. Okay, who else got me?
living for some inspiration. I got my pen, I got my pad, I write your dedication. You see this poetry, my medication. I ain't a doctor, but I work on patience. I've been reflecting on my life, who I be around. I think it's time for me to go. You want to hear the sound? If you want to make a come up, gotta settle down. Protect your soul when you fight. See your last round. It ain't gonna ask how. And I'ma tell them I deserve this, cause I. In a lot, cause that's the first grind and I'm moving silence. But I'ma tell her how I see it, that it's not surprising. Money don't mean you hit the top, cause that it's not the highest. I'm so inspired. Working with these demons, there is so much I acquire. I don't rock no bitches, come out goofy and be flyer. I've been about my business, I ain't looking to get higher. Never working for the man, I wear my own attire. Now I'm in the man, I'm always praying to inspire. Give it up for Yusuf Koma. Alhamdulillah. So thank you all. Thank you all for coming.